Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's, it's been such a pleasure to be here. This ALIAS conference is really fabulous. So I thank Joe and Helmut for making it happen. And, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thank you. So, um, yeah. <laughs> And, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this work. It's been a really fun project. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, kind of looking at quantitative, from a quantitative viewpoint. Okay, so Baptiste already talked a little bit about Lagrangian cobordisms, but just to set notation and things. So here, can everyone see, I hope? Okay, so here, okay, Lagrangian cobordisms. between Legendrians. So. Okay, so I'll always be working in the symplectization of the one jet space. So working in R cross J1 of M. And the symplectic form I'm looking at here is DE the S alpha. Okay, so my coordinates, I, my, S, my real coordinate is always S for me. And then this is going to be X, Y, Z. Okay, and alpha is my standard contact form, dz, dz minus y dx. Okay, so as I'll usually draw these pictures, Baptiste tries to draw them horizontally. <laughs> so this is my s direction as I'm increasing here. And then, so sometimes I'll draw these kind of slices. So again, this is my j1 of m. Usually my pictures will be, this is sort of my x, my z and kind of a Y that I can't really see. A lot of times I'll just be drawing front projections of things here. Okay, so we have, um, so we have these slices of the, these contact manifolds as we go up. So my notation, I'll always use lambda plus or minus for Legendrians. And again, when I'm in J1 of M, I'm always using the, the, the cons, of the contact structure given as the kernel of that standard form here. Okay. And so, for example, let me just, I'll try and tend to draw things. So, for example, I could put a one here at some slice above the other one. Let me put another one down here. Okay. Okay. And then we'll have a Lagrangian. So, between them. Okay. So I'll always denote my Lagrangians by L. So this is going to be a Lagrangian. And it's going to be both cylindrical and exact. Okay, so it's going to be, um, okay, so cylindrical. So I'm always going to call my, so at some point S plus and S minus, after that point, my Lagrangian is just going to look like a, a cylinder, okay, on both of these ends. Okay, so cylindrical outside, S minus and S plus. And it's also going to be exact, meaning that this one form, we know it's closed because it, we're on a Lagrangian, but I want that actually be a closed one, exact one form. And I also want, this varies a little bit from convention. I want this that e to the s alpha restricted to um, at the ends. So let me just say, yeah. So e to the s alpha restricted to L is going to be df. But I want that, that function to be constant at, on my ends. So if it's just, if we know that function is going to be locally constant. But if I have a link down here instead of just a knot, I want the same function on both of the pieces. But in fact, this is the correct image, right? So what you say again? This is the I think so too. It's because it works for gluing, yes. <laughs> Baptiste will disagree, maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. So F is constant when S is less than S minus or S is bigger than S plus. Okay. Good. So, 
so these have been studied. There's been a lot of really interesting work in recent years from kind of qualitative questions, and that fits into what, like, what Baptiste was talking about. You know, it's to talk about what's the topology of these and, and various questions, do these exist? But Josh and I have started to do, look at these from a quantitative point of view. So our first quantitative question is, I'm going to fix two Legendrians. OK, and so this is usually my lambda minus. Lambda plus is my notation here. I'm going to fix two Legendrians and then ask, what's the and if I look at all possible Lagrangian cobordisms between them, what's the minimal length? And here, length is in terms of the non-cylindrical portion. OK, so So again, in my pictures here, let me just kind of say, so here's my lambda plus, my lambda minus. And again, it's cylindrical after this point. So if I, for a particular Lagrangian, I would just try to, um, the cobordism length for a fixed one is equal to the, the length of the non-cylindrical portion. No, they can be different constants. OK, yeah, just yeah, one constant down here, one down there, and one up there. Yeah, good. <laughs> OK, so again, this is just going to be s plus minus s minus. OK, so just kind of the difference of those heights here. But again, the point is we're just fixing the, Leg the Legendrians so we can look at all possible Lagrangian coordinates, try to kind of squish them together as much as possible. So again, if you looked at this just from topology, there's, it doesn't, you know, everything would be essentially zero. You get those arbitrarily close all the time. So now adding in these geometric conditions, does it change? Do we get flexibility like you would see in the topology world? Or is there some rigidity? And we'll see both, OK? <laughs> so good. OK, so for example, let's first start with flexibility. OK, so, so flexible meaning there's arbitrarily short. So there are arbitrarily short Lagrangian cobordisms. Between, OK, give you some examples. So, in this, you, once you thought about qualitative questions, you have to be careful. This is really, these are fixed Legendrians. I mean, really not just fixed the isotopic class. This is just fixed Legendrian submanifolds, OK? So for example, um, you can get a short one between a Legendrian and its vertical translate. Any vertical translate. OK, so in my pictures here, so for example. Sorry, <coughs> not use the red. OK, don't use red. OK, good, sure. OK, is that better? OK, good, OK, good. OK, sure. So OK, so let's just take Alejandrian down here. OK. And then look, just, just take it up in mean, natural way. How do I get another Lejeune? We'll just move it around. Again, you usually tend to think of those as all the same, but they're actually technically different Legendrians. OK, so any sort of translate here. And remember that this, uh, when I draw this picture here, remember that means that when I'm saying vertical, that's kind of vertical in the, so <laughs> not this S vertical, it's Z vertical in the slice. OK, 
Okay, so I won't draw this picture very often, but let me just try to draw it one time here. Okay, so here, for example, maybe my Legendre is down here, and I've shifted it up again in the Z direction. It doesn't matter, any, any direction, positive or negative, okay? So basically, and I'll just denote this, this is essentially zero, meaning that I can get it arbitrarily close to zero. Okay. <clears throat> A lot of my pictures are, are going to be one dimensional, but in general, the results are, there are higher dimensional results. So. And I should say the first part of this talk is written up in a paper that's on the archive, so there will be more precise statements there. <laughs> okay. okay, so okay, that's a natural one. What's another natural one? Let's just shift it to the right or do some sort of here. So a Legendrian. And it's horizontal. Again, horizontal in terms of the base manifold. Translate. Okay. So, for example, and now I'll just start to draw the pictures this way. Okay. So, if I take a, a knot here, and now just kind of, so I just shift it over here. Again, this is going to be approximately zero. And now this can be. Generalize, for example, this can be generalized m much more. So, for example, if I were to not just do a horizontal translate, but actually do any sort of diffeomorphism of the base isotopic to the identity. So, for example, if I could, I could really stretch this out, you know, just kind of, again, things coming from the base here. If x is higher dimension, I could rotate it around. So, lots of things that you can do here. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. You mean of the full manifold? Yeah. Right. No, that's what we'll start to see <laughs> eventually. Right. OK, good. So um, a Legendrian. And the last one I want to emphasize. And it's vertical expansion. So, so in here, when I say between this and that, I'm always saying the one on the bottom first. Okay, so here, for example, okay, so let's take a Legendrian and say this is one here. And now let's put this up here, bigger. So this is two. So it could be anything as long as it's bigger than or equal to one. This is going to be, again, approximately zero meaning get, get it arbitrarily close. OK. So yeah, you go ahead. I start. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> OK. OK, good. Good so far? <laughs> OK. OK, so now let's look at what what's so maybe everything is flexible, and it's not an interesting question, right? <laughs> so let's look at now rigidity. Okay. So I'll just say this as there exist obstructions to arbitrarily short. Um, between, okay, so as you might guess from my, my statement here, now if I do an expansion, it's short. If I do a contraction, there's going to be obstructions to being short. So, uh, so a Legendrian and its vertical contraction. So in particular, 
let's look at, um, I like these unknots, okay. So if we look at our unknot here, so now let's start at two at the bottom instead of having two at the top. And now let's have just one at the top. Now you can't get it arbitrarily close to zero. In fact, this is going to be approximately ln of two. Okay. And again, this means that it has to be at least ln of two, and you can get arbitrarily close to ln of two. Okay, so. Good. And um, another one that's kind of interesting to look at, and we were interested in understanding how two Lagrangians might interact. Okay? So let's, so in particular, let's look at hoplings. Let's put hoplings at the top and the bottom, where individually the components could be, cons could be connected by a short Lagrangian, but see if the presence of the other Lagrangian forces it to go longer. Okay? So. Let me write that and make sure everyone's clear with that. So, okay, so I'll just call this vertically shifted hop flings. Okay, so let's say that, um, <coughs> okay, let me make a link down here, a hop link. So each of my components, again, I'm just going to have height one here. And to make a hop link, I'll translate it up. Okay, so probably don't need other colors, but just to, I don't know, I probably won't look. Okay, so for my notation here, let's just say I'm taking exactly the same unknot and just shifting it up by an amount u. Okay, and that's what I'll call lambda minus is, I'll call this hop of shift u. And now let's look at lambda plus, which is going to be a half of shift, half of shift v. Okay, so here. Okay, so a different amount. Okay. And now again, again, whenever I'm looking at this u and v, u and v, they are bigger than zero and less than one, just so that I actually get a hot blink right here. And now we can actually calculate again. So again, this is kind of interesting because again, the green, and I'm interested in Lagrangian cobordisms of, of two cylinders, you know, cobord concordances here. So the U to, the green to itself again, are, well, it's just the same, so it could be short. The, if I just was just shifting the blue by itself, it could be arbitrarily short. But together, you can't, they can't be arbitrarily short. Okay, so here what you get, is you get approximately, well, depending on u and v, either you get ln of u over v if u is bigger than or equal to v, and you get ln of 1 minus u over 1 minus v if u is less than or equal to v. Okay. The ln is only a feature of exponential. Yeah, in so, yeah, so in some sense. No, yeah, yeah, no real geometric meaning. Yeah, so here, yeah, whether it's u over v or ln, the key is that it's not zero, okay? So that, that's the, the real emphasis of, you know, whether you're changing. Say again? And in that we can compute it, yeah. So again, this is that, it has to be at least, and actually by constructions we can show you can get arbitrarily close to that. Okay. So that's just a sampling. We, we did some other sort of problems where, you know, we kind of started to think about like, boundary value problems, like say you, I, I fix the height to be at most one, you know, so I fix the heights to be one, you know, what can I, if I start with my bottom to be a particular hop flink, what hop flinks, you know, multi, many more components could I get at the top? So that's just, again, that, that appears in our paper on the archive, but you know, so there's lots of other sorts of problems you can study 
You can take a loop of, uh, of non-contractible Legendrians and kind of see what's the length of that cobordism. And so, but this gives a flavor of some of our results. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think, no. Yeah. So yeah, we'll never yeah, realize that. Um, good. So the statement's clear. I'll, I'll say a little bit about the proofs of this. OK. So good. So the proofs. So when we construct them, so when I say upper bound, so upper bounds are just from a calculations and people have a lot of these that I've been looking at all of these are isotopic Legendrians and so there are constructions to go from a Legendrian isotopy into a Lagrangian cobordism and it's just a matter of actually really analyzing that and kind of understanding in general people will say oh if you slow down the isotopy you can guarantee that it's embedded but often you don't have to slow it down and so it's just doing a careful analysis of, of the I Legendrian isotopy to Lagrangian construction. Okay, so Okay. So let me sketch how we do the obstructions. So again, how do we know that it has to be at least ln of 2 or any of these numbers? So, so the first part is to assign a capacity to your Legendrian. OK, so OK, so it's not any her Legendrian. Again, our Legendrian is always lambda. So this is going to be C. It'll depend on lambda. It'll depend on, the, on augmentation. So these are only the Legendrians that have an augmentation. And theta, OK, so this is going to be either a positive number or it could be infinity. And here, epsilon is an augmentation. of the DGA associated to lambda. Okay. And theta is just going to be a linearized cohomology class. So again, this is a linearized Legendrian conduct homology, cohomology. So this is sort of like a, it's a, this is not going to be a Legendrian isotopy invariant. So I mean, if you move your Legendrian, this number is going to change. It's basically sort of a spectral type, type invariant. You're kind of seeing at what height do various classes list, live. So looking at rape heights, of course. OK, so once we have those, then the next step is to relate the capacities for the ends of a cobordism. OK, so, so I'm going to call this the length capacity inequality. <laughs> Just try to mimic the energy capacity inequality. OK, so this is going to be a length capacity 
inequality. Okay, so assume that our the one at the bottom has an augmentation. Okay. So if there exists a Lagrangian cobordism. L from this one to any other. Okay, that is cylindrical outside of my interval, S minus S plus interval. Then, for all, if I cohomology, linearized contact cohomology classes in starting at the bottom, we have that e to the s minus times the capacity down there. Is less than or equal to the e to the s plus times the capacity of the one at the top. Okay, now I have to, I'll, I'll explain this in a second. This, these are, these come from the Lagrangian. Okay. So in particular, just doing some algebra, you can start to see where the, the natural logs are coming in here. So this tells you that ln of my capacity at the bottom the ratio of those capacities is, is giving us a lower bound to the length. Okay. Um, but let me just, I'll say a little bit more how you define epsilon plus and theta plus. But so here you can start to see. So in my example rate here, It'll turn out, we'll look at, like, if you looked at a fundamental capacity, you get the two at the bottom and the one at the top. That's why we're getting that ln of two right here. Okay. If you have like a one and k, you get ln of k? Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of the ratio of heights. Okay. Okay. So let me just say a word. the epsilon plus and the theta plus. Okay, so, um, so again, from our Legendrians here, we have our algebras. Let's call this algebra lambda minus, algebra of lambda plus. So if I have an augmentation, I'm usually thinking of these augmentations just so Z mod two here. And so from a cobordism, we'll have uh, Cobord is a map. Again, this is this has been done by other people, and um, this is then the induced. This is what I mean by epsilon plus. So this is by definition just the induced map here on the here. Okay, and also from the cobordism, we'll have induced maps on lin linearized contact cohomology. Okay, and the idea here, whatever I start with as my, my cohomology class in the bottom, what I mean by theta plus is just the induced map here, induced by the cobordism here. Okay. Um, so a lot of this has been standard, you know, adapting it to this setup was just to, you know, trace through the filtration a little bit, understanding how the filtration levels work with all these cobordism maps. So you can see like, uh, 
a kind of a trick in doing all this is it looks fine, but you have to be careful to choose your classes to make sure that this isn't going to zero. Okay, because again, this going to zero means that basically you have an infinity here, so you have the ln of, you know, so an minus infinity turns on this side, which is not going to help you very much. So, so in general, a lot of times what we're using are um, the fundamental fundamental class because one thing we know is that the, this is going to the fundamental class here is going to go to the fundamental class there but also with work of Baptiste and the other people you know under certain concordances you can say other things you know about isomorphisms and things so um, that's kind of the the argument of how that works okay okay so that, um, that's all I was going to say about my first quantitative question. So that was length. And now we're going to go to width. Okay, <laughs> so. Okay, and so everything up to now appears on the archive. So, but now it's going to be more preliminary. Okay, so just things we're starting to explore. Okay, so again, all of this is with Josh, Josh Stabloff again. Okay, so another quantitative measure is the relative Gromov width. So this concept was first introduced by Burrell and Cornea some years ago. Okay, so The typical Gromov width, we kind of start with a symplectic manifold, and we just look at the largest ball that we can embed inside here. Now, if I have a Lagrangian, okay, so now, now let's put in a Lagrangian in here, and now I want to look at the largest ball where precisely a Lagrangian, the intersection of the ball with a Lagrangian plane goes to the Lagrangian. So <laughs> the Lagrangian plane goes to the Lagrangian, nothing else goes. So it's precisely, so let me try to draw sort of my, my ball here. So you have these balls here that are kind of, that disk is, or that, is that real part plane is just going into the Lagrangian, nothing else. You don't want it to touch anywhere else. Okay, so let me write that. So the width of L is going to be the soup. And I tend to label my balls by capacities instead of radii. So So usually this has been studied for closed Lagrangians, but we thought, well, why not? Let's study it for cobordisms, so these non-closed non Lagrangians. So first thing is, is um, is it's not very interesting if you don't be a little bit more careful with your question, okay? so. If I, for any Lagrangian cobordism, the width is going to be infinite. Okay, so again, so here, so whatever Lagrangian I have here, 
So the issue is, is this positive end, okay? So we always know we can put a, a little ball in here, but then I take a very big ball and I can formally shrink it here, but then when I translate it up, it'll be conformally expanding, so the conformal things cancel. So as long as I have this infinite cylinder on the top, the width is going to be infinite, okay? So here, so we have this is infinite, and in particular, let me start to introduce this. If I go from, my, um, from, from any s naught to plus infinity, okay, is equal to infinite, again, okay, where I'll start to introduce this notation here. Just means I kind of chop it off, okay? The space, the whole space I'm chopping off, and where my embeddings lie. So in general, LAB is just L intersect S between A and B. So, a better question. So now, let's look at these Lagrangian coordinates and get rid of the positive end. And now try to see the width of what remains. Okay, so now I'm, you know, I'm looking at a particular Lagrangian cobordism. Suppose L is a Lagrangian cobordism that is, and now I'm going to fix that, I'm just always going to set S plus to be zero. Just make it a little easier here. That is cylindrical outside s minus to zero. And now the question is, what is the width when I chop it at the zero? And in particular, when we started to work with this, it was kind of like, oh, we have this length kind of measurement, and the width, is there any sort of relationship? You know, is it small width, big length, <laughs> small width? Or, you know, so kind of find a length-width relationship. <laughs> yes, also, also chopping the symplectization, right? Yeah, so everything is chopped at zero. Good question, yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this is still stuff in progress, okay, <laughs> okay, good, okay, so, well, the first thing is a claim, and, well, it's certainly work in progress. How long have you guys been thinking about this? This width? Yeah. Oh, the width, we've only been thinking about it for a couple of months, you know, so, so this claim is kind of, yeah, we've been thinking about it. This is want to show, we pretty much believe it's true, I'm not quite sure what to put, I'll just put claim, you can interpret that with as many grains of salt as you want, okay? <laughs> so if lambda minus has an augmentation, then the width of the cobordism, again, chopping at zero, and again, using this whole setup where it's cylindrical outside zero and, and s minus, is going to be less than or equal to two times the fundamental capacity at the top. Okay, so this is, again, this is the fundamental class as came up in Baptiste. Okay, so um, the strategy is to use a version of unit rulings. Okay, so in general, so for this 
kind of unirooling, I mean, for a generic point in your Lagrangian, you could find a holomorphic curve that passes through that point, that at, it has a positive puncture towards the rape chord representative of the fundamental class, and has all its negative ends augmented. Okay, so if L is just your a trivial cylinder, then this follows just by the definition of the fundamental class. And for more general Lagrangians, it should follow from Ekholm, Honda, and Kalman's sort of ideas of why the fundamental class goes to the fundamental class. But we haven't written down all those details and gotten that all sorted through. So, okay, so in particular, In particular, if true, the claim would imply that if I had um, any Lagrangian cobordism, which has this a knot with one at the top, any one I put down here, straight, you know, curvy, whatever, that would be less than or equal to two. So, to, again, all of these problems, there's like upper bounds and lower bounds, you know, construction. So this, now we play with the constructions, okay? What can we actually construct? Say again? Yeah, you know, the bottom has to have an augmentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, here, I'm, this can be lots of different things, but it has to have with augmentation. Okay, so, good. Calculations. Okay, so, first of all, let's look at a trivial cylinder. Okay, so again, what I'm just doing is just doing that straight down, so exactly the same. Then what we find, and this is just going to be my notation, then there exists a ball of approximately two, meaning that I can get arbitrarily close to two into here. Okay. So that hopefully upper bound is actually realized just with a trivial cylinder. Now let's look at <coughs> the contracting concordance. Okay, so let me put, um, okay, so let's put a one here and a two. So now remember, the, the smallest this could be was ln of 2, approximately. You can get arbitrary close to ln of 2. So first of all, let's look at the case where it's ln of 2, where it's really kind of tight. <laughs> then, <clears throat> now hopefully this notation will make sense. Okay, so this would be ln of 1 half here. This would be 0. If I try to look at a ball that just fits into that part of the Lagrangian cobordism, then there's only a very small ball that fits, okay? So there exists a ball of radius epsilon into here. I mean, this is, this is what we can construct, okay? <clears throat> so when it's tight here, it's really hard to get a ball in there. But if I allow myself to go, okay, so here, that's, that's just going to be in those. If I allow myself to go all the way to minus infinity, then I can get arbitrary close to 2. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> 
No. <laughs> it's, yeah. No, I mean, because this isn't really, it's, it's all kind of, this isn't really ever ln of 2. This is always a little bit bigger than ln of 2, and so this is, yeah. But we could, we couldn't, can give you a particular approximation. But yeah, there's a lot of approximations in these embeddings, so. Good. Now let's, but now let's like make, so in this case, in this sense, you're starting to see, like this is sort of rigid in terms of, I mean, as close as I can. And this is sort of, I would think of this as rigid also, that you can't fit a very big ball inside there. Now, if I make it more relaxed, same Lejeune's, but let it spread out, then it's easier to get a ball in. Okay, so here. And now let's put this way down here, okay? Okay, so now this is much bigger than zero. Now, essentially, well, if I make it long enough, I can get essentially as close to two as I want. Okay. So again, again, relaxing the cobordism concordance here also kind of relaxes the ball, makes it easier to fit in a ball. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And again, we're not. Yeah. Oh, in in our constructions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in our constructions. Okay. Okay. So let's let now let's look at the expanding contract concordance. So now let's put, again, I want to keep the one at the top so we can keep in mind our, so one up here, oops, one half down there. Okay. <clears throat> now remember, this was easy to do, right? So I can get this arbitrarily close to epsilon, so, or arbitrarily close to zero, so as small as an epsilon as I want. And now, if you try to see well, what kind of ball, there exists a ball here, at least one, OK? You can always get at least one into here, again, depending on what the epsilon is there. Okay. So again, kind of seeing again, the, the flexibility here is again reflected in you know, much more flexible balls that can, can go in there. And again, if you allow yourself, this is just going from 0 this is just going from 0 to ln of, OK, so this is just epsilon here, OK? If I allow myself to go all the way down to minus infinity, again, I can get arbitrarily close to 2. And you can play with these examples a little bit more. Um, so for example, if this is one third here, then you can get at least a ball of radius size four thirds. So kind of like the more you you squeeze this, the bigger the balls get over there. So um, yeah, that's good. Um, I can say a little bit about the constructions, but that's pretty much what I plan to say. So thank you. <laughs>